so Allah has already planned everything for us and has said the outcome. Uh, if you end up in heaven, heaven and hell, then why? I've got a pen. I was going to draw like a diagram. I thought, you know what? Let me put it this way. First of all, I'll tell you the wrong way of answering this, yeah? The question is as follows. Like, why is there free will and um, determinism at the same time? Qadr has to be defined in the following way. Qadr is not just the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qadr is four things. Qadr is the knowledge of Allah, that Allah knows everything, that he knew everything that was going to happen to you, that he knows that you're going to go to heaven or hell, etc. It's the mashia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If, if it's, the, it's the kitaba, first of all. It's the written, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written everything in Lawh al-Mahfuz. It's the mashia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he willed it into existence. And it's for the khalq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he created your actions. Yeah, he created your actions indirectly, clearly, because you did your, your own thing and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created it. Um, this is Qadr. So this is one of the six pillars of Iman, which we, every Muslim has to believe in. Um, now, how does this, how you can be asking now, how is it possible and how could it be that you have this, all of these things, and how could that be correlated or otherwise um, reconciled with the fact that you have free will? Now, the wrong way of answering this question, which I heard a popular speaker, I'm not going to mention who it is, but uh, answer it. He said that basically, imagine this as, uh, as a classroom, yeah, and then basically the teacher, he knows who the clever people are and who the the, the weak people are basically in the classroom. And so he, he predicts that the clever people are going to get it right and the weak people are going to get it wrong. Yeah? This is the wrong way because actually you've solved one, which is knowledge, but you have not solved kitaba, written, you haven't solved uh, three, which is uh, mashia, nor have you solved actually the, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he put it into action himself. Ah, now it's becoming a little bit more juicy. How do you deal with this? <laughs> the way you deal with this is follows. You ask the question, what First, the question is, and this is a really important question, how, what, is, what are the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not do? The things that would stop him from being Allah. So, for example, Allah is al-alim. These are from his, what he calls sifat dhatiyah, his, uh, his uh, attributes which relate to his essence. So, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-alim. He has all knowledge of everything. Yeah? He's one. He's al-ahad or al-wahid. He is, um, <laughs> give me another one, al-hakim, something else, yeah? That he is al khaliq or al khalaq, there's two. So he is the one who creates it. You get it? So if he stops being any of those things, at any time he stops being Allah. So if Allah stops being one and there's an, he creates another God, that's khalas. Uh, Allah is no longer Allah. That's how it works. If Allah becomes a man, and this is what uh, our argument against Christians is if Allah becomes a man, that disqualifies him from being Allah. He's not Allah no longer. Therefore, the things that cannot change, they are what we call lazim, they are completely stuck to, I mean, they're, they're unchanging attributes of Allah, are those things which are, uh, are def define his essential attributes. Now, the question now would be, and this is important, can Allah create a scenario whereby you are doing your own thing, it's your own free will, and Allah is doing it at the same time? Now, the only reason why anyone would say, no, this is not possible, is because it would stop Allah from being Allah. That, was, that would be the only logical reason why anyone would have any objection of why Allah wouldn't do anything. Because we say in the Quran, it says, Wallahu ala kulli shayin qadir. Allah is over all uh, things powerful. So if He's over all things powerful, who should be able, able to create this scenario? So the answer would be, yes, Allah can create a situation no matter how overwhelming it is for us to fathom, which we cannot fathom, how it does it, the, the metaphysics of it, the strings of it, yeah, this is completely above our uh, pay grade. You're not going to get this. You're not going to understand it. Of course you're not going to get it. It's like asking, how can we fly in Jannah? How can we fly in heaven? Okay, you need to be able to see heaven first and, and to be able to, to deal with it. The ghaib, the unseen realm, is something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-musaytara over. He's, he's someone who is completely has saytara over it, which means he has complete power over it, control over it. We know very limited to do with this world that we live in. Imagine we're talking about the metaphysical world. So it's impossible for us to know the, 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 the mechanisms of it. How, the how is something impossible. Can Allah do it? Absolutely. So going back to our example, just to finish this off, of the person writing the exam. Yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the, the analogy was a poor analogy by the speaker because he said that you know he knows who will do well and who will not do well. It's more like he goes, this guy's sitting in his cubicle and he sees his test already done for him. However, how, is, how can that be reconciled with the fact that he has to write his own test and life is a test and free will? Huh? There's another, there's two tests basically. There's one test which is 
the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has filled out for you and there's the test that you have to write yourself and both of them are corresponding how Allah knows best how do you get it so the, basically you have a test you have free will as a human being that free will is identical to Allah's will how Allah put that into action because he can do that how you don't need to know how everything you don't even know why is it why is it the case that you know micro and micro what do you call it physics you don't even know what, what there are so many uh, paradoxes in that regard you don't even know how to deal with physics you're talking to me about the metaphysical and jannah and heaven and qadr no so but what this does and this sorry I'm, am i should i give two more minute all right <laughs> what this does yeah i do apologize what this does huh it gives us an incredible kind of optimism one that it's impossible to achieve, I would say, from an atheistic perspective. What did the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu he say? He said in Sahih Muslim, and the Rawi is the Suhaib. Yeah, Suhaib says that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu says, "Ajaban li amr al-mu'min." Wondrous is the affair of the believer. Inna amrahu kullahu, uh, kullahu lahu uh, khairun. That certainly all of his uh, affair is good. And this is not the case except for anyone, except for the mu'min. Why is that the case? So the Prophet tells us why. In asabatu sarra shakar. He says, if good things happen to him, he is thankful. in asabatu darra sabara wa shakar. And if bad things happen to him, he's patient and he is thankful. Now, wait a minute. What does this mean, practically speaking? Now we have uh, this kind of this narr meta narrative that is pushed by the atheists, yeah, which is that religion, as Marx put it, is the opiate of the masses, and it's something which is constraining. I tell you something, today, wallahi alazim, this hadith is a beautiful hadith that gives us the opposite picture. We cannot, as human beings, control the extraneous variables of life. We cannot control the fact that. A bus might run somebody else over, to, or yourself could run you over. Anything could happen. Your parents could die. The worst of the worst can happen to you as human beings, to us. But as this concept of Qadr in Islam, what is written, destiny. You know when two people meet each other, it's destiny. We have to believe that as an article of faith. This part of Islam that we have, it gives us an incredible emancipation and liberation. It allows us to go into the the world which is swaying us around with all these extraneous variables and saying as a human being whatever happens is good for us that's something the atheist can never dream as a psychological from a psychological perspective of obtaining impossible if something bad happens to him as the brother put he's just jumbled atoms so he's being rearranged his mother's just been rearranged <laughs> His father's just been rearranged. The child has just been rearranged. It means nothing. It has no spiritual value. For the Muslim, it has every single spiritual value. And that's why, subhanAllah, the opposite is the reality from this Marx quote, the opiate of the masses. Religion, in fact, is that which, as Rousseau put, Rousseau is an interesting philosopher. He said that man is born free and everywhere in chains. I tell you today, wallahi, the way to release yourself from the chains of society and societal expectations is to embrace the garment of Islam. <laughs>